Hey y'all, Scott here. What'll it be? Mario Kart 8! This is a bar. Alright, so Mario Kart 7, it happened. There was nothing we can do about it. What can the series do next? I got it. Mario Kart 8 was a series big return to using even numbers and is easily the game that had the most writing on it. See, released for the Wii U, Nintendo's least favorite little disappointment. That system was having a hell of a time not failing. I mean, how was that possible? It launched in November 2012 with... Uh, and then a year later in 2013, things got steamier with the release of- I'm really trying here. To be fair, of course the Wii U had some solid games at this point, but they just weren't enough to get people interested in the console. The Mario games released for the system were fine, but they looked like any other Mario game. A Zelda remake, Lego game, a game that launched the same week as Grand Theft Auto V, the third entry in a somewhat niche series that was pretty much dormant for a decade, and Game & Wario. What the hell is a Game & Wario? Yes, all of these games were varying levels of good, but can you really blame anybody with a pulse for not buying a Wii U? Oh my god. What the Wii U needed was a Nintendo game that looked significantly better and more fun than any other Nintendo game we've played in the past. One of the Wii U's problems was that most of the games you'd buy a Wii U for looked pretty similar to games you already had on your Wii. We needed a game with mass appeal that felt like a huge step up from previous generations. His mustache moves in the wind! Mario Kart 8 was the Wii U's big chance to redeem itself, the system's killer app. Up until its release, the console was just kinda And when Mario Kart 8 came out, the console went from to as previously stated, the Wii U launched in November 2012. It sure did. Contrary to what most will say, the launch was pretty solid in my opinion. There was quite a lot to play, and no games that made anybody other than the die-hard Nintendo fanboy who'll buy anything they release by the console. It's Wario. But if you bought the console at launch, you had quite a bit to play. Nintendo Land was great fun. New Super Mario Bros. U gave your thumb something to do for a few hours and nothing more. Third-party games weren't exciting. I mean, Mass Effect 3, oh my god, didn't that release eight months ago and didn't everybody f***ing hate it? Regardless, you had stuff to play on Wii U. And then January hit. There wasn't much on the Wii U's horizon in terms of game releases for a good few months. Sure, Rayman Legends was set for February, but Ubisoft said, Our OK M-rated zombie game exclusive to Wii U didn't sell as well as we wanted. Let's delay Rayman and put it on other platforms the same month as Grand Theft Auto V. I'm still not sure if that was a good idea or not. Basically, there wasn't much coming until March, so Nintendo had to step up and give fans a reason to be excited, and what followed was easily one of the best moments for a Wii U owner next to it getting discontinued. The Wii U Direct focused on reaffirming games we already knew were coming, alongside soft announcing some as well. Now, many of these announcements were for games that were far away from releasing anytime soon, like Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem, which ended up releasing in 2016 as... Not that. Yoshi's Woolly World looked quite a bit different and was simply called Yarn Yoshi at the time. The next Zelda title, later to be Breath of the Wild, was discussed, but the reveals for games happening that century happened to be a new 3D Mario game and a new Mario Kart. Now, nothing was really said or shown about these other than they'll be at E3 this year. Personally, I was more excited about the new 3D Mario game. I mean, these games can be so unbelievably amazing. They've defined their generations in gaming and set the standard for games to follow. But then there was Mario Kart, like I give a f all right, let's be fair. An original 3D Mario was kind of what the Wii U needed to feel justified with its banana bolt controller. Surely a 3D Mario would take advantage of it. I mean, the Nintendo 64 controller was made with Mario 64 in mind. E3 2013 arrived. I'm sad. Anyways, I was obviously happy for a new Mario Kart, but I felt the same way I did when the previous title, Mario Kart 7, came out. I just wasn't that excited. I mean, Mario Kart's Mario Kart. It's more of an inevitability than a huge event when one released at that point. I think I was still upset I was bad at Mario Kart Wii. E3 2013 arrived. I'm glad. Oh my god, this game looked like a huge leap forward for the series. Up until this point, Mario Kart was never really a huge graphical showcase for any system it was on. It always looked pleasant enough, but most of the time the presentation ranged from underwhelming to good enough. Mario Kart 8 actually looked like it was taking advantage of the hardware it was running on, who'd have thought? The gliding and underwater segments from 7 were quickly revealed to be returning alongside bugs from Mario Kart Wii, with one major element being this game's standout feature. Anti-gravity. See, now the tracks can twist and turn all around. It doesn't matter, your cart can go on the walls. Newton was a f anyways. At the end of the trailer, Mario's cart does this and forms an eight. See, Nintendo stated they named it Mario Kart 8 because there's this one course that looks like a Mobius strip, which looks like an 8, so you know let's name this one Mario Kart 8. Even if this was the third Mario Kart, they'd still name it Mario Kart 8. Mario Kart TV was detailed, being a way to share replays of your races with others online, and the release date was... 
If you were a Wii U owner in June of 2013, you should know, hearing this game wasn't coming out for basically one more year, that was not my ear's finest moment. We all saw what happened with the Nintendo 3DS. When it launched in spring of 2011 throughout that year, it struggled because of a high price and not enough software, but it all came together that holiday with a price cut and the back-to-back -back releases of a 3D Mario game and a Mario Kart. And ever since, look at this thing, it did really well, had a ton of wonderful games, and kept getting game releases in 2019, my god! Things were lining up for the Wii U to experience the same fate with a 3D Mario and Mario Kart down the pipeline, but Mario Kart was coming a good bit later, unfortunately. But obviously, that was for the best, as the game was still a bit early on. Looking at the demo playable at E3 that year, a good bit changed by its release. Tons of user interface tweaks, gameplay mechanics, the music wasn't finalized yet, and they used Mario Kart 7 and Mario Kart Wii music in a few places, but hey, Waluigi was back after being cut from Mario Kart 7. That's right, they were brave. Info would die down until December 2013. A new trailer showed up after Rosalina was announced for Smash Brothers for 3DS and Wii U. That opened up with a reference to Mario Kart and made everybody question if Kirby was gonna be in Mario Kart 8. See, no, but in the Mario Kart 8 trailer that followed, Baby Daisy was. New courses and characters were shown off, and thankfully it wasn't long until we saw even more during the February 2014 Direct, a new trailer debuted, and this one was great. I think this was truly when it set in just how gorgeous as this game was. This trailer focused on the announcement that all seven Koopalings were gonna be playable racers. Thank God! Honestly, this was a pretty neat announcement initially, but I think people realized how ridiculous this was when they saw the final character select screen. Like, imagine this is your brain. Jesus, man, seven tumors? A little over a month later was when Nintendo was going into full press mode with this thing. April hit and they invited tons of game journalists to try out a nearly final version of the game, and alongside it, we got another new trailer showcasing more new tracks, characters, and finally some new items. The biggest aspect of this trailer was the reveal that Mario Kart 64's Rainbow Road was making a comeback, and it looked beautiful. That's the thing Nintendo finally figured out what the hell they were doing with editing at this point. Does anybody remember Nintendo's official videos back in 2013? They couldn't figure out how to capture their own gameplay footage. This is Mario Kart 8 trailer, they have this fun transition to the reveal of N64 Rainbow Road. They actually knew what they were doing, they knew how iconic that track was, it felt like they were proud of Mario Kart 8 and wanted to show it off. Less than a month later, the Mario Kart 8 Direct randomly popped up on YouTube. What could this be? A 30 minute comedy skit? I'm not complaining, it was just a bit unnecessary. The final details on the game were debuted here one month before its release, such as the final new characters, tracks and items, a Wii U console bundle, and an offer for Club Nintendo members. If you registered your game within the first two months, you could pick one of four games to download for free. I never understood this promotion. Wasn't every Wii U owner already gonna buy Mario Kart 8? Wouldn't it make more sense to do this promotion with like, Bayonetta 2? Oh well, I got myself Pikmin 3 for buying Mario Kart 8, Nintendo 4 Possibly gave me a game for free for buying a game where I would have bought both of them separately for full price, the nerve of them. And that was pretty much Mario Kart 8 up until its release on May 30th. It was an exciting time. 2014 was truly the year the Wii U started to fully feel like a solid console, with Mario Kart and Smash Brothers coming out later that year. I have a lot of fond memories of waiting for this game to come out, and watching all the previews and reviews I could, all during that perfect time of year in the spring where the weather is just right. And not only did it feel good outside, but we had this amazing looking game coming out as well. I look back at the build-up and eventual release of this game with a lot of fondness. Of course, something I look forward to with every Mario Kart game is the battle mode, which weirdly enough, Nintendo wasn't detailing at all with this game. We didn't know anything about it up until its release, but you know, you can't really mess up battle mode that much. At its worst, it'll probably be like Mario Kart Wii again, and even then, that was tolerable. It was just kind of not my favorite. So either way, let's take a look at the game that saved the Wii U. The game that justified the Wii U. The game. Here it is, Mario Kart 8 Red Case and all. Yep, goes wonderfully with the blue header and white spine and blue white Nintendo. Let's talk. I understand why you gave a game like New Super Mario Bros. Wii a red case. I mean, the entire box art is red, including the spine. It was cute and it was a one-time thing, but if you're gonna go to the length of making the case red, why not go all the way and make other parts red like the Wii U header? <laughs> At least the box art is fantastic. It feels very much like Mario Kart DS, but with actual color and stuff going on. Also, apparently, if you follow the logistics of where the racers are, Mario and Peach are supposedly going the wrong way on the track. Another Mario Kart tradition lives on it up the box art. You know, I could have picked up the Mario Kart 8 Limited Edition, it was only available at the Nintendo World Store in New York. Scratch that, I couldn't have picked it up. That's what you call a limited edition, only available in one specific place. At least here in the US it was. It was far more readily available in other countries. Wanna know how I know that? Well, here's the European version of the same damn game, and here's the North American version. All they both come with is a damn shell. Well, if I can't own that stupid fucking thing, I guess the only thing I can do is play this stupid fucking thing.
can't believe I could have this much fun inserting a disc, and I haven't even done anything yet. This is a glorious moment, and my ears are digging every second of it. My Record 8 features live recorded music, and it goes for this jazzy vibe, and it is incredible. The music in Mario Kart was never bad, but most of the games just kind of sounded the same. Like, here's the Mario Kart 7 title screen. I'm using Mario Kart Wii music here. They all just kind of blend in for me. Again, they're not bad, but I don't hear any defining characteristics of DS's music compared to Wii's or 7's. 8 has its own flavor, and the fact that it's all live recorded gives the soundtrack a feeling of significance that the series lacked up until this point. The title screen's theme is amazing, and after a while it plays Super Mario Kart's title theme. Uh, tons of Mario Karts have had the Super Mario Kart theme thrown into their main themes, but there's something that feels so good about the implementation in 8, I love it. Heading into the menus, well, I don't know what else I'm gonna do. On to the character selection. Whoa. So initially this would be your starting roster and you'd unlock more characters by just playing through the Grand Prix. You'd unlock a random character for beating a new cup, that's it. That definitely makes things pretty simple, but my god, did I work my ass off to unlock King Boo and PD Piranha and Double Dash. That was a nightmare, but I am so proud of the memory card they're on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I unlocked everything, but I feel absolutely nothing looking at the complete character select screen for multiple reasons. Now listen, Mario Kart 8 has the highest number of playable characters in the series yet, but there are some baffling exclusions, and the new racers, okay, remember when I said they introduced the Koopalings as characters? Those are your new ones. You're welcome. This character selection is like a weird combination of Mario Kart Wii and Sevens with some characters that make no sense to be here, with staples of the series left out for seemingly no reason. Bowser Jr., Diddy Kong, Dry Bones, King Boo, Birdo, all not playable in this game at all, while Metal Mario returns from Mario Kart 7. Baby Peach and Baby Daisy return from Mario Kart Wii. And like I said, seeing the Koopalings playable in that original trailer was pretty cool, but they ended up being really the only new characters we got in this game, and when seven of the 30 playable characters are variations of the exact same idea, uh, but that's not all. We got two other new characters in the form of Baby Rosalina. Listen, as your resident Mario Galaxy player, that game had an entire backstory for Rosalina, and I will say Baby Rosalina makes no sense. No, Baby Luigi, that's fine. And of course, Pink Gold Peach. Metal Mario, you could someone give a pass to. Weirdly enough, a metal version of Mario has been a part of Mario games for quite a while, and in Mario Kart 8, the metal effect looks kinda cool. I don't like him here, but I won't waste a picket sign on him. Pink Gold Peach and Baby Rosalina as well were never a part of the Mario series prior to this game. They were put in here because they were easy peasy to develop. You just take the Baby Peach and Baby Daisy models and tweak them a bit, bam, Baby Rosalina. You take Peach, make her entirely pink gold, bam, skin disease. The Mario Kart 8 roster may be large, but it's so focused on filler that it doesn't feel like we have nearly as much variety as before. Don't get me wrong, there are still enough characters to choose from, the selection could be far worse, but Mario Kart Wii's had so much more variety in terms of characters of different shapes, sizes, colors. I'm not the biggest Birdo supporter, but I'd rather have one Birdo than five children. Let's see how much of this roster is pure filler. So we have five babies. At the most, I think three would be fine. So let's cut out two. Metal Mario and Pink Gold Peach are the definition of filler characters. They're just Mario and Peach with lead poisoning. Cut them. All seven of the Koopalings. Honestly, you just need Bowser Jr. to represent what they represent, so cut six six of them, and the remaining one we could just label as a work in progress Bowser Jr. And there we have it, about one third of the roster taken up by pure filler. The other two thirds are just your typical Mario Kart cast, nothing sticks out all too much. But well, moving on, car customization makes a return from Mario Kart 7 with the customization menu looking like they took the bottom screen in Mario Kart 7 and put it on my TV. Car customization is the exact same as it was in 7. It's fine, but I just end up thinking about how it was in Mario Kart Wii, it was a lot quicker to just pick your pre-made cart. Here it gives me the illusion I'm building my own vehicle but it doesn't feel like my creation or anything, it just feels like it takes longer to pick a cart now. Well, let's get a move on to the tracks. We select the first cup, and... They finally changed the Mario Kart formula! In actuality, it's more Mario Kart. How could this be? It's most similar feeling to Mario Kart 7. Nearly all features that game introduced make the return in 8, so hopefully it now makes sense why Mario Kart 7 isn't that appealing to go back to for me. It's basically a gimped Mario Kart 8. We've got gliding and underwater sections, the controls feel pretty much the same, and of course, who could forget the coins? Seriously, who could? It's five letters, it's not that hard. The first person view didn't return though, can we really call this a sequel? Now considering this is a Wii U game, surely this game utilizes the Wii U's controller, right? You'd be surprised, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is a Wii U game. 
and it doesn't. I remember when the Wii U was first being rumored. The only thing people really knew at that point was that the controller would have a screen, and a specific idea people had was making that screen the rear view mirror in a Mario Kart game. That would be hell. Imagine having to look up and down from the gamepad to the TV screen. God. Now nah, here they have some light touchscreen controls if you want to live that way. And during a race, it's a horn. I love that this controller single-handedly made the Wii U far more expensive than it had to be, and its biggest game's core use of it is a f***ing horn. To be fair, we can toggle through different modes, we can display what's on the TV and show off a map, which is handy, but you'd think you'd be able to do split-screen multiplayer this way, with one person getting their own full view on the gamepad while the other person gets the full TV. No. If you're playing local multiplayer, the gamepad's display is a split-screen, just like the TV. Great. Split-screen multiplayer in Mario Kart 8 is a bit lacking in general, not only due to the lack of asymmetrical multiplayer support, but because when you play with three or more people, the frame rate gets cut in half to 30 frames a second. Listen, I'm not that picky, but it is very noticeable how much choppier this game gets when playing with more people. It's fine, but it's just a bit jarring. It's probably more noticeable because outside of multiplayer with three plus people, this game is smooth as butter. It looks and feels incredible. The character models look outstanding. The lighting and the small little details on the tracks, the vehicles, the drivers themselves. This is not only the best looking Mario Kart game, but one of the best looking Nintendo games in general. These tracks are filled to the brim with details. All these racing advertisements and nods to the Mario universe make these courses truly feel like they're a part of the Mario world and not just random Mario Kart tracks. They didn't cheap out on any area other than the audience here. Guys, like, come on, the rest of the game looks so good, but you're just gonna make the audience look like poster boards? Of course, Mario Kart 8 features anti-gravity racing, something unlike anything Mario Kart's experienced thus far, and you're staring at it right now. This is anti-gravity racing. It's not the same as regular racing, I swear. Anti-gravity in Mario Kart 8's a bit weird, considering it seemed like it was gonna be a much more obvious feature in the marketing there. The camera really sells you on the gimmick. If a racer's on the ceiling, they'll be upside down. In the actual game, the camera stays consistently behind the player at the same angle all the time, so if you're upside down, it's not immediately noticeable. It's only when you ride on the side of walls that you'll instantly know. When you pass a blue strip, your wheels shift to the sides and you just gained a hover cart. When you bump into these safety hazards or other racers, you get a little boost. And that remains consistent until you pass a blue strip again. Then we're back to reality. Anti-gravity may have seemed like a marketing gimmick. I didn't say it wasn't. The trailers and commercials really pushed it, making it seem like a big thing. It always show racers upside down and all around while when you're actually playing the game, yeah, I may be upside down here, but this feels like your everyday Mario Kart. It's not even that noticeable when you're on the ceiling. But what anti-gravity truly adds is insane track design. Now that the developers don't have to uphold to the laws of physics because we all know that was a Mario Kart constant in the past, these tracks can go absolutely wild. They twist all around and make older courses feel pedestrian by comparison. It's a similar addition to the underwater sections in Mario Kart 7. It doesn't initially feel that different, but when you look at how it affects the track design, it definitely allows for far more creativity. It's truly game-changing and makes these courses not only aesthetically interesting, but allows for the core layout to be as well. Item-wise, we have the mainstays at this point. Basically, everything returns from Mario Kart 7 except for the Super Leaf and Lucky 7. Instead, this time we got the Crazy 8. It's the same as the Lucky 7, but now gets a coin thrown into the mix. I missed the Lucky 7. The Piranha Plant is new and appears in front of you for a short period of time, biting anything nearby you, racers, items, you name it. It automatically chomps, and each time it does, you speed up a bit, but you can jam on the item button if you just want to get it over with. The Boomerang Flower you can throw in front of or behind you three times, and the Super Horn blasts everything around it and can destroy anything. Ink and piss, other racers' aspirations, and most notably, the blue spiny shell. Prior to this, you would have to use a mushroom to outrun a blue shell, and even then, that was tricky. I've looked up videos on people outrunning the blue shell in Mario Kart Wii just because I couldn't imagine that ever happening. I also looked up what happens when you get a blue shell in first place. That. This is an item that you always want on you in first place, and it's always a tough decision regarding whether or not to use it on a red shell that's about to hit you, for example, or wait for a blue shell to appear to use it on, because most of the time, if you end up securing a super horn, that means a blue shell is soon to follow. Overall, the new items are all okay. I don't mind the boomerang or piranha plant, but they just don't really leave much of an impression. I don't really feel that empowered when I get them, but the super horn is a very strategic weapon, and I love its inclusion because it ties into one of the biggest problems people had with Mario Kart 8 that I absolutely loved. See, in 
previous titles, you could hold on to something like a banana peel to defend yourself from the back. While defending yourself, you could grab another item to store in your item slot. Here in Mario Kart 8, you can only hold on to one item at a time. If you're defending yourself with a banana, you can't grab another item in reserve. On top of that, I initially refused to mention that coins can now be an option in the item roulette, which makes them an immediate threat to public health. Yes, there's just not enough coins on the track when I grab an item box, I'm asking for a coin. Yeah, getting a coin as an item is incredibly annoying, but that adds this interesting strategy to Mario Kart 8. You can use up your item to grab another item, but it may be a coin and leave you defenseless. You have to wager your options every time you use an item. In previous games, when you pass through an item box, you'd get something that you could defend yourself with at the very least. Here, I don't know, I like the element of strategy that the single slot and coin item bring in here. Everybody else fucking hated it. I can see why. Like I said, the new items aren't that cool. They're fine, but couple that with only one item and the coins, and this is one of the more boring Mario Kart's item-wise. The balancing is actually pretty good. I mean, there were some times I got a crazy eight in like third place. I don't remember selling my soul for that. But mostly, this is one of the lesser bullshit Mario Karts. It feels much more fair. There's a very clear strategy to use with the items. But since I recently played Mario Kart Wii, that is so obviously more frustrating with its item balancing, but my god, it was more interesting. Mario Kart 8's items feel too bland. And when I look back at the garbage I put up with in Mario Kart Wii, I... I like kind of miss it in comparison. The balancing was so crazy that it made it fun in its own way. I'm not saying its balancing is completely boring. Like I said, I like the strategy involved with items now, but Mario Kart Double Dash and Wii felt more like what everybody expects out of Mario Kart. Craziness happening at every moment. With eight, I feel way more on autopilot with these items. Hold on to the banana until somebody throws a shell at it. Grab another item box. Pray it's not a coin. Son of a bitch. Grab another item box. Didn't I say I like the item setup in this game? Well, I still do, but I can at least see why a lot of people didn't. But one thing I hope we can all agree on is how amazing literally all the tracks are in this game. I have to hand it to them. They hit it out of the park. Every track is at the very least pretty damn good. They all have their own unique background music now, which weirdly enough is a first for Mario Kart. Every game had a couple of courses that shared music. Here, it's all unique and it's all sublime. Even the tracks that are pretty basic have this wonderful flair to them. And then we have the tracks that are incredibly complicated and they're a joy to experience. I just love the selection in this one. Starting out in the Mushroom Cup, Mario Kart Stadium. I love the atmosphere here. It feels like I'm a superstar. Water Park, an oddly generic name for a water park that is very obviously themed after Wario. This is my favorite feature in Mario Kart 8. Drama. Sweet Sweet Canyon is all about donuts in the sort. It's a wild track to describe that makes you look f***ing insane if you try to. The donuts everywhere! Thwomp Ruins is cool because there's a section here that utilizes anti-gravity gliding and underwater sections. Who knew Face Rocks owned ruins? Mario Circuit, the Mobius strip the game's name is based off of. I never really think of this track for the figure eight design. I usually remember it for Trauma. Toad Harbor! Well, if Toad's here, that's gotta mean it's good. This is just a very happy feeling track. The sunshine, the cable cars, all the different pathways to race on. This is one of the first tracks I think of when thinking Mario Kart 8. Twisted Mansion! Do you really think a haunted house would be scary when flooded? If I'm underwater, the last thing I'm freaking out over is a ghost. I love the rippling floors and the knights attacking you at the end of this one. Then there's Shy Guy Falls. I usually kind of group this one together with Thwomp Ruins in my mind, but they're pretty different tracks. You drive up a waterfall, there's this little nook you can fly into. Completely different. Sunshine Airport. This would not fly in real life. But it does make for a fantastic track. I do wish they had a longer section inside the airport itself, but I can't really complain considering outside is probably way more interesting. Dolphin Shoals is about jumping in and out of water, riding on an eel. Again, this is physically improbable. Electrodrum is the highlight course of the game. It's the most visually and musically appealing. So many colors and lights with the music being synced up to the action, and it's followed up by Mount Wario. One big track, three sections. You start from a plane, and you travel throughout the ski resort to the end, and the music adapts to what segment of the race you're on, this is it. This is the best cup in Mario Kart history. Oh, I gotta see what follows. Oh my god. Well, Cloud Top Cruise is fantastic. I mean, it has a Mario Galaxy remix as its background music. You could throw up in my face to Mario Galaxy music and I'd say that's a good Mario Kart track. But then we move on to Bone Dry Dunes. This is probably my least favorite track in the game. It's not bad at all, but it's easily one of the least inspired feeling ones. I just don't really like desert areas in games. Out of all the tracks here, this is the one I could care the least about visiting in real life. Like, what is there to do here? Bowser's Castle is a step up. I love how this giant Bowser attacks the different pathways, but it ends with a doozy. Rainbow Road, obviously the biggest staple of any Mario Kart. All the games have to end with their own iteration of the iconic track, and with this game having anti-gravity as a gimmick, I couldn't wait to see Mario Kart 8's Rainbow Road, especially after seeing the N64 one remade. This is lame. It's not a bad track, it's just pretty basic, definitely in comparison to Mario Kart 7's version. You go on a Rainbow Road, that's a good start, and then we go into a space station, 
and then go onto another rainbow road and repeat. It's fine, but for how amazing all the other tracks are, it's shocking to me Rainbow Road with the anti-gravity mechanic is so basic in this game. But like I said, it's still a good track, all of these are. And that's just half the story, with the other 16 being the retro tracks. Obviously, these have been a feature in the series for quite a long time, but most games, they felt like filler. More tracks to give you more content. It was nice to have them, sure, but you could almost always tell what was a retro track and what wasn't. In Mario Kart 8, they completely redid everything, and the retro tracks look just as new, if not newer, than the new tracks. They added anti-gravity, remade all the music, even changed up some things aesthetically. Like, Moo Moo Meadows from Mario Kart Wii takes place during sunrise, and it's gorgeous now. I love the tracks they picked here. And sure, they had to pick courses they didn't remaster in previous games yet, so some fan favorites didn't make the cut, but by god, we have some great ones. It's so fun to see Moo Moo Meadows, Toad's Turnpike, Royal Raceway, Wario Stadium, Yoshi Valley, TikTok Clock, and of course, N64 Rainbow Road. Though they changed it to be a three section track rather than a three lap track. Come on, half the fun of the original was that it was overly long and grueling to complete. Online is back and it works great. Instead of giving you the option to select any track in the game to play online with random people, it now gives you a random selection of three, which I prefer. I found that when you give me 32 tracks to choose from, I'm probably just gonna either pick the same one over and over again, or I'm gonna take too long to pick one. Having three makes it way easier to pick and keeps tracks from repeating too often. Online is great in this one, but it's really hard to make friends with people and ask them for their email with these pre-made chats. We can save replays and edit them with Mario Kart TV, post them to YouTube and Miiverse. Not anymore, it was a stupid feature anyways. You'd be able to create 30 second highlight reels of your race, but eh, it wasn't that big of a deal to me. Well, in terms of other modes, eh, stamps. You get stamps in this game for completing time trials and beating Grand Prix with different characters. You were originally able to use these stamps on Miiverse. Not anymore, it was a stupid feature anyways. Speaking of Grand Prix, when you finish one, you just get a highlight reel from one of your races. Not the traditional award ceremony cutscene. I mean, it's not a big deal. At least we get these cool trophies. They're such amazing designs. We can even touch them with our thumbs on the gamepad. But the lack of a cutscene, sure, the way it's presented here makes sense in the context of the whole Mario Kart TV thing, but was this game rushed? Obviously no, not my Mario Kart A. They put so much love and attention in every little detail with this game. This was probably an example of them going, no, we want this to make Mario Kart TV feel more like a sports broadcast thing. Either way, we have one more mode to check out, and that is Battle Mode! What the f is that?! Battle Mode has been a staple of the Mario Kart series ever since the very beginning, but it seemingly was getting less and less attention with each entry. And of course, with Mario Kart 8, Nintendo barely mentioned it until damn near 20 seconds after it released. Balloon Battle is all we got here, and... Wait, Moo Moo Meadows? That... That's a track. Oh... Oh my god. Wait, I'm not supposed to talk about this yet. Let's talk about the updates. So Mario Kart 8 wasn't perfect right out the gate. It wasn't perfect ever. There were a few big issues at launch, like after a race, the option to move on to the next race would be the second option. The first option was viewing a highlight reel. <sighs> Nintendo. Also, the map wasn't available on the TV screen. You can only view it on the gamepad. <sighs> Nintendo. Well, they fixed these via a free update in August of 2014 that arrived alongside Mercedes-Benz car parts. God, tell that to a dealership. What made you want a Mercedes? Well, it plays Roy Koopa a lot, and the GLA goes with his eyes. It was really weird to have such blatant product placement in a Mario game, but I've only lost a couple nights of sleep because of it. But during the summer of 2014, it was fully announced Mario Kart 8 would be getting paid DLC packs, both crossing over with various Nintendo IPs. You could pre-purchase the DLC packs for $12 in total, or $8 separately and it was an insane deal. Six new characters, 16 new tracks, carports, and for buying both we got multicolored Shy Guys and Yoshi's Yes! So DLC Pack 1 offers two new cups, the Egg Cup and the Triforce Cup, alongside Tanuki Mario and Cat Peach and Link. Guess which one's the most interesting? The tracks offered across these are amazing. Yoshi Circuit from Double Dash is back, Excite Bike Arena is a tribute to Excite Bike and it's so much fun, it's so many ramps and areas to do tricks off of. Dragon Driveway is awesome, and Mute City was the most Nintendo's acknowledged F-Zero in years. Wario's Gold Mine from Wii and SNES Rainbow Road made a comeback. The retro tracks they brought back were a bit more interesting than some of the ones they picked for the base game like Grumble Volcano. And some of these were already remade in older games, so it's nice to see they were willing to double dip a bit. Ice Ice Outpost is pretty lame. Not bad, but not my first pick for anything. And Hyrule Circuit, a wonderful trip through the world of Zelda. DLC back one was awesome. It came at the perfect time for me, right when I was starting to get a little old in Mario Kart 8 in November, and bam, here are some amazing new tracks and things to spice it up. They also included amiibo support where you can unlock character outfits for your me. 
It's a dream come true. Now, DLC Pack 2 came in April of 2015, and uh, it was a bit lame for me. The tracks didn't wow me in this pack all too much. A Baby Park from Double Dash came back, which was nice. A Cheese Land from GBA. I was happy to see them make an actual course out of these GBA tracks, but it's not really anything that stands out to me. A Wild Woods? It felt like a lesser maple tree way from Mario Kart Wii to me. And Animal Crossing? Nice name. It's a fun course, the type of season is randomly decided so it stays pretty fresh. But then there's a Neo Bowser City from Mario Kart 7. This just wasn't interesting enough to warrant bringing back. Ribbon Road from GBA is a pretty cool one though. It's in a kid's room and has a lot of fun details. Super Bell Subway is okay and we have another F-Zero track. I'm not complaining but I can if I want to. Just make a new F-Zero Nintendo, I'm a Nintendo fan, that's a catchphrase of mine. Of course, Villager and Isabel from Animal Crossing became playable alongside Dry Bowser. Thank God he's back! So the DLC rounded out Mario Kart 8 quite well, but we have more tracks than ever with a better character selection. It's cool to see Nintendo willing to do more crossover content with Mario Kart, but that was far from the biggest story here. They added 200cc to the game alongside DLC Pack 2 as a free update, my god it was too fast. I remember this was a pain to get a hold of originally, you had to do a lot more braking on corners while drifting, and most of these tracks were never designed for this kind of speed. But was a cool little free update to a game that was already one of the best Mario Kart experiences, hands down. It's the best looking Mario Kart, the best sounding Mario Kart, the best controlling Mario Kart, with the best tracks in the series, hands down. I am a bit bummed out by the lack of things to do in the game outside of racing. Like basically, play the Grand Prix and play online, that's all you can really do. But when it comes down to it, Mario Kart 8 was the definitive Mario Kart experience at the time of its release. But they just had to f up the battle mode. So they didn't put any battle tracks in here, they just used existing ones. Okay, that's already lame, but they couldn't have even been bothered to alter the tracks just a bit to make them more suitable for battle mode. They're terrible, they're so big and designed to loop around, they aren't small closed in arenas like battle tracks should be. And out of all the tracks to choose, why Toad's Turnbike? Why Yoshi Valley? Why Toad Harbor? And when you die in battle mode, you come back as a ghost and can still hurt the other players. That's not fair. What the hell were they doing with this mode? It's ridiculous. I almost would have preferred if they just didn't bring the mode back, or at the very least, if they just remastered old battle stages and nothing more. That would have been okay. But no, instead, this is the worst mode in any Mario Kart game. And it used to be my favorite Nintendo. What is wrong with you? See, that should show you how bad this mode is, it made me break something. But I still did that out of anger towards Nintendo. Now what the f*** am I doing?